God bless you and welcome to another episode of Living Emmaus, a serialized program on the Holy Eucharist presented by Verbum TV. Uh, Living Emmaus, uh, dear listeners or dear viewers, as uh, we have already explained, is about uh, uh, experiencing the risen Lord in the Holy Eucharist, uh, following the example of the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. That is why we call this Living Emmaus. And uh, to uh, uh, give us uh, an insight into the Holy Eucharist, we have with us once again Reverend Father Cecil Joy Pereira. He is the director of the Daham Sevener Seminary in Kalutara and also the former Archdiocesan Director of Sacred Liturgy, a very erudite uh, scholar in Sacred Liturgy. And he's the best example we could have on a program like this to explain about the Holy Eucharist and help us to understand what we celebrate every Sunday, every time we enter, every time we, uh, you know, enter that sacred presence of the Holy Eucharist, which is the source and summit of our Christian life, the place where we are nourished by the Lord. So, uh, I welcome Reverend Father Cecil Joy once again to Living Emmaus, Father. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you very much. So, dear viewers, last time, uh, in the last episode, we were talking about the liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, and then uh, in the liturgy of the Eucharist, we talked about the preparation of gifts and we came up to the offertory procession and concluded with the offertory hymn, which is supposed to accompany the offertory procession. And we talked about the theological, uh, you know, uh, theological aspects or that should be uh, guiding the offertory procession and so on. So by now you know all that. And so, but there is also another problem with regard to the selection of hymns for the offertory. There are times we have noted that uh, sometimes the choirs and the choristers uh, are not very familiar with the, uh, you know, Father, I think I should pro talk to you about that. Uh, some of our choristers and uh, even those who are preparing liturgy sometimes are not sure about what should be the guiding principle in selecting an offertory hymn. I mean, sometimes they even select a penitential hymn, something more penitential, or you know, a, a, a hymn that is more suitable for a Holy Communion or something. They try to use it for a offered hymn. Is that okay? What would be the guiding principle, Father? There. Uh, frankly, I'm a little surprised about the question itself. How could people, uh, you know, miss this kind of thing? Because the clearest guideline is the text of the hymn. Right. So the choristers or those who are in charge of selecting uh, these hymns must go through the text first. See, this is a kind of a general weakness we have among us choristers. We go by the melody very often. Yes. A catchy melody. Catchy melody. Yeah. A sensational one. Yeah. And then we are caught up with that and then we think that's the best one to sing. Yeah. But that's not the best place to begin with. The best place to begin with is the text of the hymn that you are selecting. Yeah. So go through the text. And the text must have you know, some essential things like that we are bringing our gifts to the altar. Okay. And uh, better if we mention bread and wine, mm -hmm. that they, they are being offered to the Father through Christ. Mm -hmm. And also, they could mention uh, the aspect of uh, the human uh, contribution, our labor, yeah. which also have uh, uh, contributed uh, our, uh, on our part uh, to transform these things which mm. God has given us, so that they are, by our labor, by our hard work, are now uh, brought to that level of the fruits, the mm. bread and uh, the grapes or the wine. These are the basic things. These are the basic things. Other than that, if they are talking about receiving communion at the table, of course, then we must understand. It's, I think, very simple for us to understand that it is not the appropriate place for that kind of hymn right. and certainly not penitential hymns mm. certainly not mm. penitential hymns good hymnals would have these things already categorized right you know there would be, would be a separate uh, segment 
under the title of a trihims. Yeah. Right, our fatrahims actually they are not really technically offertrahims, they are hymns that accompany the offertory procession. That's right. Okay. So they would be categorized separately. So I don't think it's a very big uh, problem. But if there are issues like that, then the choristers and the, those who are in charge of the choirs must really study this subject. Correct. Yes. Right. Thank you for the clarifying yes. that father. Yes. Right. So that now that we have cleared that section about the entrance procession and the entrance hymn, I think now we are talking about the preparation of gifts. Preparation of the altar, I think, is also another appropriate word. So what are the things that you we have on the altar that is used in the preparation of the gifts? Yeah, that's a good way to uh, begin this discussion yeah. because we don't put anything and everything on the altar. No, we don't. That's a principle. That's a liturgical principle. There was a time when we used to put all the, you know, baskets of vegetables and fruits and even sometimes collection baskets also right. with mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. on the altar, the national flags and all kinds of flags. No, certainly no. no. They are not part, uh, they are not things that we place on the altar. Yeah. On the altar, people must be able to very clearly see yeah. the bread, mm -hmm. the wine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe an extra ciborium or ciboria, yeah. the crucifix of course, mm -hmm. and the misa, right? right? Of course, uh, something that uh, cannot be avoided is the microphone, yeah. right? Mm. But in uh, many of the Western countries now, they use what are called these boundary mics, which cannot be seen at all. Mm -hmm. And they are very powerful, very sensitive, uh, uh, high-tech uh, equipment yeah. that, that help us to really, you know, get uh, rid of that kind of problems because some of the microphones, especially when they are with these, uh, you know, very colorful, uh, these pop shields, yeah. and uh, they, they attract our attention far too much. Right. Our attention must be on the bread, on the wine, and on the action of uh, at the altar. Right. Right. Mm. Other than that, we don't have anything else. So mm. this this must be very clear. Even you know things like sometimes nowadays we have uh, practical difficulties. What do we do with the face shield? Right. <laughs> what do we do with my mask? Uh, mask? Mm. What do I do with my spectacles? Yeah. What do I do with the <laughs> very large glass of water? Mm. Right? Whether they can be placed on the altar as much as possible. Of course, there can be uh, occasions when uh, things are unavoidable, but as much as possible, even a glass of water for the celebrant. Right should not be on the altar. Mm -hmm. It could be on a small table close to the altar, mm -hmm. right? Even uh, other things like extra books and things like that. Yeah. Because the altar is Christ. You remember we spoke about that, no? Mm, yes, we altar is Christ. Yeah. And here we have the bread and the wine, which is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's it. So it must be very, 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 very clear that uh, the altar must not be cluttered with other things. Right. Right. Incidentally, what is the? Uh, maybe we could talk also about the altar cloth, the one on the one on the top and the one that they put on the skirting. Is there some kind of color schemes or things that we? Yeah. Or? Yes. I think uh, I think uh, we uh, must be very clear about the altar cloth. Uh, the guideline is at least there must be one white cloth on an altar, right. at least one, mm -hmm. right? Then the altars, if they are good altars, are not draped round. Right. Many of us uh, make this mistake, mm -hmm. but sometimes that mistake is better than uh, the, the blunder that is the altar itself, mm. because some of the altars are not really, you know, uh, up to the expectations, liturgical expectations. Right. The altars must have actually two main uh, symbolic ideas. That is the table, right. the table concept, the table mm -hmm. of the banquet, and the altar of sacrifice. Right. 
Yeah. Therefore, altars actually cannot be see through. Mm -hmm. Right. Should be solid. Good, good altars are actually a table and a kind of a stone because originally, if you read the Old Testament, the altars were stones. Yeah. And that's where they made the animal sacrifices. Mm -hmm. No, that's why the middle part of it must be covered and with a symbol of sacrifice. That's mm -hmm. why very often we find this uh, lamb right. entangled in a uh, uh, thorn bush mm -hmm. as a, a symbol of that sacrifice. Sometimes even a pelican, sometimes the last supper, some mm. things like that. So when you have a good altar like that, why should you drape that with a cloth? With a cloth, yeah. Actually, that must be seen because the people then see the table of the banquet, mm -hmm. that is a table-like thing, but the middle is not open, right? It is not void. It is also covered because that is representing the stone of the sacrifice. Of the sacrifice. Right. right. But if you have an altar which is symbolically very poor, right, just a table, hmm. that's only representing one side of the expected okay. liturgical mm. symbolism. Mm. Therefore, that kind of thing could be covered and then with a kind of a symbol of sacrifice in the middle, that would be better. That's why I said mm. it is better to cover the blunder than to make that mistake make of mistake. draping round. Yeah. So the, the ideal would be when you have a good altar, there is what is called an antipendium. Mm -hmm. Antipendium is only a kind of a very narrow uh, border on the table part of it only, yeah. so that it doesn't cover the part below. Yeah. Now, once again, uh, I think I mentioned this, uh, Trevor, the, the other blunder we make now is, having done all the hard work about making a, a nice and beautiful, uh, altar. beautiful and uh, liturgically, Liturgical. you know, mm. meaningful altar, mm -hmm. we go and keep flowers right in right. front a fence of flowers, mm -hmm. especially for weddings, yeah. so you lose everything. Right. That should not be done. Mm -hmm. They must be instructed that th these flower arrangements could be on either side, but not cover Covering the, the altar. altar. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to this uh, preparation of the altar and the gifts, now there are things that uh, people know, or maybe they are not very sure, namely, the Special uh, linen we use, hmm. right, at the altar during the time of the preparation and the Eucharistic prayer. Right. Now there is uh, the corporal. Mm -hmm. Corporal is a square, uh, white piece of cloth with a cross at the center. Comes from the Latin word corpus, meaning the body. So, the chalice, the ciboria, and the pattern, they are all kept within this boundary, right. within the corporal. Mm -hmm. And whatever is within the corporal is consecrated. consecrated. So, if you have something extra, you keep it outside. Right. right? And very important, um, you yourself uh, is an extraordinary minister of uh, Holy Communion, supposing you bring a ciborium after distributing communion, mm. you must keep it within the corporal, corporal. Yeah. not outside. No. What is consecrated mm. and what is to be consecrated is within the corporal. So yeah. corporal also serves as a kind of a boundary. Mm -hmm. This is the boundary, mm. right? And there is a particular way of folding that. That's right. Right, because the idea is it is folded like a purse, so mm -hmm. that when you fold it inside, nothing falls out. Outside. Mm. And those days, actually these things must be revived now, the sacristan, especially those days, they were nuns, right? And they took the corporal after the mass. There was a thing called the purse, like another purse. Yeah. And they made the first wash at the sacrarium, a yeah. special kind of a uh, wash basin meant to uh, wash only what is sacred. The sacred vessels. Sacred vessels and only. 
sacred corporal. linen, corporal, hmm. purificator and so on. Because the duct is directly into the ground, right. not into any drain. Hmm. But unfortunately, in many of our sacristies, these things are missing. Right. So what happens is, we very carefully fold the corporal and once it is taken to the sacristy, it is, you know, like a, like a, a <laughs> napkin or a handkerchief. Mm. Uh, you, you just dust it and then all the sacred particles, if they are present, mm -hmm. could be, you know, going uh, onto the flow and there could be possible desecration. I did see recently that you had done some very wonderful work at, yes. the, Kalutura, at the Kalutura Seminary yes. where the Sakra room is beautifully prepared according to liturgical uh, you know, uh, guidelines. Yes. I think that's a good example for our liturgists and uh, our Reverend Fathers to maybe visit it at some time and then have a look at it how these things are done. You have a very good example. Yes, there. I did this uh, also at Arthidia Church when I was there. Mm -hmm. I did a Sakra room. And I trained some lay people also mm -hmm. uh, how to use that. Right. And now uh, in the seminary, uh, we had this, uh, you know, difficulty of not having a sacristy. Now mm -hmm. we did a sacristy and in the sacristy, I have uh, installed everything right. that is necessary mm -hmm. uh, for a good sacristy. Right. And Sakrarium is one of those items. Mm -hmm. So if anyone wants to come and have a look, that's what I said. Yes, the, that's uh, yeah, you could have that. a good, uh, yes, good, good uh, yeah, look at model. it. And in fact, uh, a few priests are already interested, and then they want to good. install a Sakrarium there. So you have the corporal, right? right. Corporal. Uh, Father, one more thing about the corporal. Now, if there are more, for example, in a, in a a big feast where there are celebrations. Sometimes there are many ciboriums and the corporal may not be enough, so they can put another corporal, right? Yes, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. And if it is habitual for such shrines, they right. prepare bigger corporals. Ah, is that so? Yes. Like for example, cathedrals, mm -hmm. shrines where they have regular concelebrations. Okay. And uh, large numbers are faithful mm. and they know, they expect them to come and they have uh, maybe about uh, five, six, seven to ten uh, ciboria every day. And they are prepared with larger corporals. Yeah. Or you can even uh, make use of two or three two or together. Three, yeah. Yeah. Better have one large one okay. so that we are very sure that it is well maintained. Right. And it's extremely important that these things are kept spotlessly clean. Mm. Sometimes you go to churches and you find them not clean at all hmm. and then how do you put the sacred body and blood on that right then we also have the purificator right. purificator is mainly used to clean the chalice and the pattern hmm. and the ciboria hmm. ciboria after distribution of after the distribution of communion when uh, the sacred uh, host particles have to be cleaned into the chalice mm -hmm. you can use the uh, purificator. purificator and the purificator is different from the corporal in the shape also it's mm -hmm. a rectangular kind of a cloth so mm -hmm. that you can have a longer uh, okay. kind of a shape which is uh, more uh, which which makes it more easier for the celebrant to clean the chalice mm -hmm. that's the one that is placed on top of the chalice uh, exactly and it's brought with the gifts exactly right. exactly then you have the chalice itself, mm -hmm. that's where you have the wine and the chalice as we said uh, is not normally brought in the offertory procession mm -hmm. and uh, it is into the chalice that you have the wine, yeah. right, uh, you, you pour the wine into that and then there is a pattern, pattern is what uh, the, the, that plate on which you place the host, host, host or hosts. Uh, if there are several priests, sometimes you have two, three mm. for the concelebrants as well. Then there is another card-like thing, right, uh, which is called the Paul, but not P-A-U-L, Paul, P-A-L-L, right. P -A -L -L, which is meant to cover the chalice. Mm. And uh, normally it is cloth, sometimes now it is also made of plastic, which is not the ideal. Mm -hmm. And this pole is kept also very clean. And it is very important that we keep the chalice covered except during 
the, the consecration. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Sometimes people wonder why should they be closing all the chalices all the time mm -hmm. and then isn't it really cumbersome to be doing that, especially yeah. when you have a, at an ordination, for example, about 10 chalices and then somebody, some deacon goes and you know, keeps covering and then keeps removing and then isn't mm -hmm. it a kind of a, another exaggerated ritual within the rite. Mm. The, the, the reason is that uh, supposing you know, insects fall, right. right? We live in a tropical country, right? And then some of our churches may not be in the, you know, the, the, the roofs, the ceilings, mm. sometimes could be leaking, yeah. right? And sometimes uh, on a rainy day, you could have water falling, right? Mm. And then uh, mosquitoes falling. I have seen chandeliers right above the chandeliers right where above. Birds and they, have put a nest, and you find yeah. dust falling in sometimes. Yes, yeah? yes, yes. You could, mm. and that's why it's very important that we keep the chalices covered, right? Except during the consecration. Mm. Why? Supposing, let's say, you have insects falling, right? Oh, it's not what's the problem, an insect, no, and you remove it. It's okay. I mean, mm. you understand, but then. There is another aspect which must be uh, discussed. We ensure that this wine is pure wine, pure juice of the grape, okay. not mixed with any other substance. Hmm. Supposing it is mixed with any other substance, so as to change its chemistry, right. then it is another substance. Yeah. It is no more the fruit of the wine, wine. the it's fruit it, of the wine, it's wine must be the pure, pure. fruit of the wine, yeah. unmixed, mm -hmm. unadulterated. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, this is an important reason that we must understand why we, that's why we keep covering. But then we do, I, maybe I should ask it later, but then we do drop a bit of water there, that, that's, that we will come to that later, right? No, no, now that you, you have this. asked. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer that. It's okay, it's okay, yeah, because uh, we, we mix just a drop of water. Yeah. That's why you see in some places, they have a smaller kind smaller of a spoon, spoon. Kind, like, yeah. you know, okay. uh, so that you can use the spoon. Hmm. The reason is, if you mix too much of water, you dilute it too much, yeah. once again, that same problem can come up. That's right. Then it is no more wine, mm -hmm. it can be some other substance. Right. So we as celebrants must be careful not to mix a lot of water. Mm. Right. It's a just a drop because there is another theological symbolism which we will discuss later. Right. Now supposing there are you know uh, instances where the celebrant is suffering from uh, gastric problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, he has been asked to uh, refrain totally from any alcoholic substances. And being the fresh and the pure fruit of the grapes, hmm. this can have a small percentage of alcohol. Right. So, supposing I am the celebrant suffering from this particular issue, in order to, uh, you know, favor my health, health, I could have very little wine hmm. and a lot of water. Hmm. Actually, it is not encouraged. Right. The first thing is my faith. Correct. I am finally drinking the blood that, of the right. Lord. Yeah. And that is the best med medicine I could ever have. Of course. Right. <laughs> the blood of the Lord. Mm -hmm. What else could I have? Mm -hmm. Right to sanctify me, to purify me, and to heal me. Heal. So yes. I must uh, approach this with a lot of faith. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Not with uh, the doctor's prescription in my hand. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, not with that. <laughs> but with the master's instructions. Right. He said, uh, "No, eat my flesh and drink my, my blood." blood. And right, that is, that, is, that is the best uh, answer I could give. Right. So, always it is some uh, wine and then a drop of water. Mm. Right. Okay, so that is the chalice, the pattern, the pole, the corporal and the purificator. 
those are the things you see on the altar of course then the cruets are brought cruets are the small containers you have wine and water in them mm. and then there is a finger bowl yeah. and a finger towel these are the things that are used and if any extra siboria are necessary then they are also brought right they are also brought mm. better that the siboria are uh, containers which can be covered also especially in our in, in our context mm. in our tropical countries because when you have this you know uh, containers with uh, open wide open uh, you know mm. uh, containers the the possibility of flies and uh, mosquitoes yeah. dropping in It's could be more mm. but at the time of the distribution they can be used, can be used yeah. but those siboria which are normally brought to the altar it is better that they have the normal siboria shape mm. so that they can if necessary could be covered right. yes right. so these are the things that you see on the altar mm. right yes so that takes us to the another most important part of the preparation of gifts the prayers father exactly and we talk about the prayers that are used for the preparation of gifts yes now we must uh, emphasize that at least occasionally this prayers be uh, pronounced so that people hear them and pe- people participate in them mm-hmm. that's why there was a time when the when liturgical guidelines encouraged us to stop the hymn after the entrance uh, after the offertory after procession the yeah now of course they say the hymn may be continued hmm. but every now and then at least at least every now and then it is good for us to allow the celebrant to pray these prayers audibly hmm. and to participate with the response mm. why treva these are two prayers which are very traditional coming from the jewish prayer traditions mm-hmm. uh, now for example we say blessed are you lord god of all creation that's right these are called berakot berakot, berakot yes mm. Beraka is the singular berakot is the plural. the plural mm. they were spontaneous prayers i must say they are even today they are using mm. orthodox conservative jews use berakot very very often and very spontaneously very spontaneously and jesus being a jew he certainly used a lot of berakot yeah mm. blessed are you lord god Uh, for revealing these things to mere children yes hiding these things from the learned hmm. that's another beraka we have yes in fact even today when the jews get together especially for the passover meal the seder they come up with a lot of berakot and they normally begin in a similar way blessed are you lord god of the universe hmm. right for bringing us together at this table for giving us this bread and this wine for giving us these bitter herbs for delivering us from uh, slavery in egypt mm-hmm. that's in the passover meal yeah. jewish passover there meal are, there are there are so many berakot mm-hmm. there are so many that are being used even mm-hmm. today right even today so we must understand that these two prayers are very old older than the lord himself you could say right right because they are coming from the old Jewish. testament tradition of berakot mm. so we we say blessed are you lord god of all creation that's how the berakot beraka begins ah yes. uh, blessed are you lord god of all creation for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you so who mm. gives the bread god has given us god has given us so we must remember in all humility even to offer something it is the lord who provides mm? mm-hmm. for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you fruit of the earth work of and work hands. of human yeah. hands mm-hmm. now these are very important elements of a beraka they always thank god for the land 
for the earth, mm -hmm. for the fruits, mm -hmm. for human labor. Right. These are very important elements, right? And they become for us the bread of life. Then we say, blessed be God forever. This is a blessing. Hmm. Berakot are blessings. What's and the meaning really, Father? Now we say, blessed be God forever. We humans blessing God. What's the real meaning between that? Uh, may God be blessed doesn't mean that we are blessing God. Yeah, because God blesses us. <laughs> yes, so yes. I just like to clarify yes, that for them. Yes. Uh, uh, th that actually means that we actually hold God glorified and gracious and blessed. Right. Not that we are blessing God. Mm. Right, certainly no, that is, that is not the idea. Mm. So, so, so is it these... kind of acknowledging God's holiness exactly, kind of thing exactly. and His omnipotence? And exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Mm. Right, not that we are blessing God. Right. God is the source of all blessings yeah, and graces. Mm. Similar with the cup. With, mm -hmm. the, with the chalice, no? Mm -hmm. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Mm -hmm. God has given us fruit of the wine and work of human hands. Mm -hmm. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Okay. Okay. These prayers must be heard at least every now and then. Mm -hmm. Right. Now that also brings us to discuss something else which is also very important. Now, there was a time, even especially in, uh, in our hymns, we exaggerated on one part of this prayer, mm -hmm. right? Now, actually, the other day I spoke about the theology of this whole thing, no? Right. It is the bread and the wine which are the main, sacrifice. main, sacr main mm -hmm. gifts, and that is the body of Christ, body mm -hmm. and blood of Christ, mm -hmm. the acceptable gift to the Father, Mm, nothing else can be, you know, above that, mm. superior to that. And it is God who provides and it is human labor that makes it possible to bring it to this stage. Uh, Trevor, there was a time, uh, and even uh, now this could happen, when we started exaggerating on the human labor aspect. Mm -hmm. For example, for? Now in some of our hymns, especially in Singhala, we kept saying it is our sweat that we are bringing, it is our oh, blood right. that we are bringing, it is our vegetables that we are bringing, it is our fruits that we are bringing, it is our mother and father we are bringing, it is our uh, beloved mm -hmm. country that we are bringing, it is our brothers and sisters we are bringing, it is our children that we are bringing, it is our flowers, uh, it went on and on and on. Okay. Finally, it got so exaggerated, mm. we forgot the main theological premises there. Premises. Right. Now, uh, I don't want to give any examples of such hymns. Hmm. In English, they are not too many. Hmm. But in Singhala, uh, there are so many. Somebody started talking about, you know, our, our <laughs> sweat and our, you know, the hard work we do. And then others kept on adding and exaggerating the human aspect of it. Hmm. We went at a tangent. This is not a very good trend hmm. because theologically it is beside the mark. Yeah. It is beside the mark hmm. to be talking about other things. So the best example is, for example, take the text of that hymn hmm. and place it against this prayer, mm -hmm. this berakot, these two berakot. Yeah. Right? And then you see, okay, what is the content here? Hmm? God is blessed. God is the one who provides. Right? And therefore we are uh, uh, holding him high as the God of all creation and the universe. Hmm. Then uh, our, uh, the, the earth produces this. Yeah. And it has been given by God. Right. And through human labor, we have multiplied and brought it to this particular stage. Hmm. So what is at number three, we actually uh, take Putting it as, as the one. most important hmm. part. I hope you understand yeah, yes, my yes, point. Yes, yes. It happened, now it's a little uh, better. I think this trend is not very good. Hmm. 
Hmm. Sure, there is the the aspect of human labor, but exaggerating on that hmm. uh, to the detriment of uh, yeah. you know undermining the role that God the Father is playing hmm. is actually not good. Therefore, yeah. these prayers are very very important. That's why they must be audibly said at least once in a way. Hmm. That's why the hymn may be stopped at the end of the. Of a tree procession, procession, right? Allowing the priest to introduce these prayers while they offer exactly, their speeches. Exactly, exactly, exactly. There is another practical thing here, Trevor. If you read the missal carefully, the rubrics of the missal, yeah. the rubrics would say, holding the pattern slightly above the altar, the priest says this prayer, mm -hmm. right? And then later, holding the chalice slightly above, above the, the altar, right. this prayer is said. Not an elevation. In Not an elevation. Every now and then we would see uh, a celebrant would elevate this. Hmm. You know, hold it very high saying, blessed are you. Uh, we must remember these elevations were actually absent until the 11th century. And there was only one elevation from the very beginning, that's the doxology. Right. Even the elevations at the words of consecration came only after the 11th century. Mm -hmm. For a long time they were not there. And especially when we prepare the gifts, right, the bread and the wine, there is no elevation. Mm -hmm. There is no showing of the cup. No showing of the chalice, no showing of the of the ciboria. Mm -hmm. to the How about people. the Latin rite, Father? When the priest at that in the history, when the priest was turning to the back towards the people and yeah, yeah, it's for the, the altar, so they are at the no, consecration. No, no, that is only at the only at the consecration. Yes, only at the consecration. Only at the consecration and the, the doxology. The faithful to yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see it's it's. Not at this moment. No, not at this moment. Certainly, Certainly not no. at this moment. But now, you see, sometimes uh, someone begins, then the others can also blindly mm. imitate. Right? And then the people could have a wrong notion, okay, this priest is so robust, he can elevate. Others, maybe because they are elderly, they are not holding the cup high. Now, it's mm. a wrong understanding. Mm. This is like, you know, I mean, to be rather crude in giving this example, it's like pantry work. Mm -hmm. It's like when you prepare something in the pantry, the curry, you don't hold your potato or the carrot high, no? <laughs> <laughs> do you do you that? No, no one will do. It's only after preparing the, uh, the, the, the curry, the dish or the main dish, then you bring it, you know, oh, here we have, uh, you know, this... Then mm. it's a kind of an elevation, yes. right? Not when you are preparing at no. uh, 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 in, in your pantry. No. So this is like you know a wrong place to do the wrong thing, mm. right? We must understand. So our people also must understand. In case we see something like that, uh, not to go and fight with the celebrant, mm. but to understand that it is not the right thing to do mm. and that we must not be critical of other celebrants who are not doing that. Okay. Right. Then uh, Trevor, you also will be noticing a few other things which are rather mysterious, no? Like uh, adding a drop of water, water yes. and uh, washing uh, fingers. The priest and, wash the fingers, his fingers. And then in small sensation, prayer. yeah, in sensation. In sensation. And those prayers are not heard by people, yeah. right? They are rather secretive prayers. And even the people are incensed and mm. people wonder why are we incensed, mm -hmm. right? So shall we take these things also one by Certainly, one? Certainly, Father. Now what happens is first the, uh, the preparation of the bread yeah. with the prayer, with the relevant prayer. Then, uh, before we have the chalice um, prepared, there is this right uh, mixing of a drop of water into the, the chalice, wine. to the wine. To the so, we wonder why. Hmm. Any answer on your part? I am sure you are aware of that. Uh, see, there is a history also. 
and there is also uh, what is uh, symbolically now accepted in the present ritual, right. The history is rather, <laughs> it is also a little bit uh, amusing. Uh, Just a guess, uh, is it to do with the human nature of Christ mm, by any chance? Well, uh, the history is, is that I told you these uh, wines were made at home, yeah. fermented at home mm. and therefore they were rather strong, okay. were very strong. So, <laughs> so in order to dilute mm. and to ensure that the celebrant would be able finally to distribute <laughs> communion. <laughs> That's a very practical kind very of practical, a Very practical, very human kind human of a kind thing. Of thing yeah. They had to dilute that yeah. mm, because when things are done at home with mm. love and care and mm. you know you add uh, something extra yeah. and you want to make the best, best, best for the part. church and yeah. for the priest and mm. then this had this. But then uh, the liturgical symbolism is that our poor weak humanity mm. which is symbolized by the drop of water mm -hmm. is mixed into the divinity, divinity of, of Christ. Christ. So, it is the human nature of the human person. Human person and the divine person. person. Right? The, the divine person is very big, very mm. large, the mm. quantity is larger, yeah. then our, our weakness, right? our limitedness mm. is so, so we mix that. Mm. That is the, that's the present uh, uh, symbolic yeah, symbol. meaning. And that uh, whatever the priest says, may this mingling of the, uh, not, not body and blood, uh, mi mixing uh, represent the divinity of Christ mm -hmm. and uh, the humanity of our, mm -hmm. our humanity. Okay. And sometimes the priest uh, blesses that water before he, or the cruet before he pours it. Well, seen that happen. Well, uh, in some of the western rites, in the old uh, rites, there was this blessing. Mm -hmm. Now the missile does not say that. Right. Right. In fact, there was a discussion on that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two sides. The blessing uh, actually meant so that this water is very pure mm. and if there are any uh, unwanted kind of thing, yeah. elements that mm. they be, you know, mm. evil uh, elements they be uh, dispelled. But on the other hand, uh, now uh, the argument is if you bless this, it becomes holy, holy water. water. Yeah. Holy water. That's yes, right. So, are you mixing holy water, holy water. or ordinary water? Mm. So, this is a kind of a discussion. Mm. So, what is preferred is ordinary pure water, pure water. Un because, because it, it represents humanity. humanity yeah. That is why mm. we normally bless that water, mm. but there are rites in the western, uh, you know, Catholic uh, uh, family of rites, there mm -hmm. are rites where this, there is this blessing also for the reason I mentioned a little while ago. Yeah. Then there is also the washing of the fingers. Right. Right. It is actually not washing of the fingers, some say washing of hands. Uh, the origins of course uh, actually are practical in nature once again. Mm. Uh, I told you there was a time when the mass began uh, by bringing all these gifts everybody yes. brought, mm. the first fruits, and dry rations maybe for dry poor. rations, mm. maybe even uh, you know livestock from their farms, yeah. eggs, meat could be. Mm. So the priest had to wash his hands, hands yeah. right? Mm. It was uh, necessary, it mm. was necessary. Mm. Then later it was given another interpretation in the Middle Ages mm -hmm. that uh, it uh, is symbolic, it is symbolic of uh, Pilate washing his hands. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that uh, before this. giving the verdict. I think even today some people, or the faithful think it's the yeah, same no, interpretation. No. Then, uh, then uh, all celebrants, all celebrants become pilots. <laughs> <laughs> P I L A T E, not P I L O T. Yeah. <laughs> Pilots, yeah. uh, we we become also betrayers, and then mm. that doesn't so sound nice fit at the, all. Doesn't fit right. at all. It, it was a kind of a, um, an interpretation given in the Middle Ages, mm. but uh, now it's the personal uh, personal preparation of the priest. Okay. We as human beings could be in sin. We are sinful, we mm. are weak people, uh, we have not been chosen as saints, mm. 
Mm. We have been chosen as sinners. Mm -hmm. So for my personal preparation, right, mm. that's a very important moment, yeah. right? When I when I whisper that prayer and then may 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 I be cleansed from my sins. Right. Right. It's a kind of a very personal preparation of the celebrant before he enters this very important, mm -hmm. all important Second segment of the duties. Eucharistic mm. prayer. Then the incensation. Now, why are the gifts incensed? Mm. Now, the history is uh, in the temple of Jerusalem, when these animal sacrifices were done, always there was an altar of incense nearby. Yeah. This was for a practical reason. Mm. You could imagine a lot of blood around mm. and uh, it could be also smelly, smelly yeah. right? And to drive away these bad smells, mm. they always had a, an altar of incense, mm. fragrant smoke. Fragrance. A lot of fragrant mm. smoke. Probably they didn't have air freshness those days. <laughs> <Good>. Right? <laughs> air freshness those days. And uh, uh, therefore they had uh, this right. incense burning. Mm. And uh, after a while, burning of incense became a symbol of the sacrifice itself. Mm -hmm. okay. The smoke rising up yeah. to... Kind that of is of course prayer. prayer. This is because it was so close to the altar of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Without burning incense, there was no sacrifice. Right. Right. Mm. So burning incense became a symbolic of the sacrifice, sacrifice. itself, a part of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is why the altar is incense. Because now we are ready for the sacrificial offering. Mm. We are ready for the sacrificial offering. We don't have another altar of incense now. No. So we incense the gifts yes. and the crucifix. Mm. But then the important question is, why is the celebrant incensed? Mm -hmm. Right? And why are the people incensed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, especially if people are baffled sometimes, suddenly the altar server appears, right, and majestically he goes on swinging the thuribal. Right in the center of the Yeah, hmm. uh, and then people wonder why, why are we, why are they hmm. being incensed, are they really uh, worthy of this kind of thing? Hmm. The priest, they could imagine, okay, the priest is incensed, hmm. right. The priest is incensed because now he is the minister of the sacrifice. Mm. The sacrifice, right? And the people are incensed because by baptism they are a priestly people. Right. To remind them, look here, you are a priestly people. Mm. And priestly people have a very special bond and a connection to the sacrifice. Right. So when people are incensed, our faithful must be happy mm. and be proud that, okay, I am a priest by baptism. Mm. And this is my uh, relationship, my connection to the sacrifice. Mm. Okay? Mm. That's why people are incensed. Right. And that's why and they rise for the incensing. That's exactly, the exactly. But, I mean, priests must rise, no, for the sacrifice. Right. They can't be doing the sacrifice seated. while seated. No, no, certainly not. Right, certainly mm. not, no. The sacrifice is a, mm. is a kind of a, you know, Active, active mm. kind of a thing, no? so they, 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 they rise, they rise right. and also to uh, show their dignity mm. as the priestly people, people. of God. Okay. Right? right? So, in brief, now we have uh, explained what is happening uh, at the altar, on the altar, around the altar. One more thing to uh, maybe to complete and to conclude this part. You would notice that the priest sometimes swings the thurible over the gifts. Mm -hmm. Because there is the tradition of making the sign of the cross with incense. Okay. Once again the sacrificial symbol. And the priest going round the altar once again because of the crucifix. Mm. Right. Which is at the crucifix is top. normally on top. Yeah. above, mm. therefore he goes. But if the crucifix is on a, side, on a side, and if there is no crucifix behind, there is no need for to us to go, in the center. no need to mm. go there. Right. So, 
if people are aware that these are the things that are happening mm. and that it is a quite uh, uh, it's a quiet moment mm. a sober moment a sober face of the graph you see that graph yeah, i think yeah. uh, last time our our, our viewers saw that mm. uh, that that chart the graph and if you notice that the preparation of the gifts and the altar is a very quiet moment it's in the valley it's in the valley yeah, yeah. and that is why uh, overly exaggerating making too much of noise sometimes with dancers and mm. then too many you know colorful things sometimes make it a rather you know <laughs> a bit of a commotion, commotion. there bit yeah. of a commotion mm. which even uh, sometimes the eucharistic prayer doesn't have mm. right that's why we are asked whenever possible as much as possible to make it a kind of a you know sober quiet, quiet moment, moment without exaggerating too mm. much on that mm. this happens especially when we bring in our cultures yes right we want to bring in our culture we want to bring in symbols we want to bring in mm. dancers and then and everybody is excited about the dance about the girls who are dancing about their dress and then that quietness mm. you no know, that uh, you know kind of a serenity we try Sacred to maintain kind of thing, yeah, yeah maintain is uh, sometimes disturbed mm. because after that we must have that crescendo okay mm. already if during the offertory procession we have a crescendo we have a kind of an apex already created mm. artificially right forced into that then it actually affects the the flow and the shape of the mass, mass. so that now leads us to the invitation by the priest asking us to pray brother and that the sacrifice may be acceptable to god and can we comment on that now or? yeah okay now that actually is already part of the eucharistic now prayer because mm -hmm. we are asked to pray that's why we are asked to rise huh? right because uh, in many places we still notice people seated now already yes. people must stand right. there okay mm. right because now we have prepared the table right now we are moving on to the other part other part with this prayer Mm. and people pray and then there is the prayer over the gifts yeah right which is normally a kind of a prayer by the priest asking god the father to accept the gifts that we have brought to the altar mm -hmm. right mm. so already this is linking up to the eucharistic, eucharistic prayer, prayer. Mm -hmm. it's the link actually so that sober moment is over now we get up now we are ready to praise god with the eucharistic prayer, prayer which we are going to take in our next yes. program i yes. think so i think we are running out of time for today's yes. program and uh, so dear viewers uh, i hope you enjoyed and uh, benefited from today's discussion on the preparation of the altar the preparation of the gifts and in our next episode we will take you through the eucharistic prayer a very important part of the sacred liturgy from the valley we try out to go up to the mountain area and see the height or the climax uh, of the holy eucharist uh, the Euchar liturgy of the eucharist in our next episode uh, and thank you very much father for that very enlightening discussion today Welcome. and uh, uh, we will look forward to meeting you once again dear uh, viewers and until then god bless you